Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming over to the morning session. This is going to be an interesting morning because we got two sessions going on with us on this stage. First of all, we're going to begin with an introduction from my friend Jennifer about a wonderful framework coming from the World Economic Forum on Inclusive Growth and Development. And after that, we're going to have a strong panel talking about reinvigorating and also rebalancing the world economy from an Asian perspective. But first of all, may I introduce Jennifer and also this specific report. The report is called Introducing a New Framework for Inclusive Growth and Development. It is looking at the world economic growth and also the social inclusiveness and many other factors that would influencing our world economy. And I was informed that this is the very first time that a World Economic Forum has ever done any report related to this specific topic. Jennifer said earlier, right before coming onto the stage, that she was very passionate about this report and really eager to share with you all of this information. So Jennifer Blank is the chief economist and also member of the executive committee for the World Economic Forum. And Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tian. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a short presentation. It should take about 10 minutes. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit why it is that we wanted to do a report of its type. As Tian said, this is the first time that we're coming out with such a report. It was released uh, just a few days ago. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the methodology that goes into it, um, how we're thinking about inclusive growth, and then some of the results that are particularly interesting. Now, just to begin, why is it that we wanted to do a report on what we're calling inclusive growth? Well, if you look around the world, and as you see on the screen, uh, there has been rising inequality uh, in recent years. And this shows over the last few decades that there has been a rise in inequality uh, in OECD countries. And indeed, if you look at other many emerging market economies, you'll see quite the same story. Uh, at the same time, there have been a number of institutions and organizations such as the IMF and the OECD and others that have been quantifying uh, how uh, this rising inequality is actually eroding at growth, so showing uh, the extent to which this is bad for growth. In parallel, the World Economic Forum carries out a report every year on global risks where we look at the interlinkages between risks and here uh, we've been highlighting for some time the fact that rising in income inequality is of great concern because it's highly uh, related to a number of risks that we're very worried about. Uh, socioeconomic risks in particular. Obviously there's unemployment and underemployment, but if you see that big line, it's really going to profound social instability. I mean, this is really uh, rocking at the foundations potentially, and we are seeing this in some parts of the world today. So what do we mean by inclusive growth? Uh, the way I think about it is two overlapping circles, sort of like a Venn diagram. Uh, and if you think about those things that are driving growth and those things that are driving social inclusion, and by that I mean that everybody's participating in the process, what we are interested in is that area in between. And we find that there are many drivers, many policies, many things that you can do that are actually useful for driving both economic growth, and social inclusion, and I will show you in a moment some of those things, what I'm talking about. I think I would also like to make the point that it is very important for the World Economic Forum to be coming out with a report like this at this time, because this really brings us back to our roots. For those of you who have kind of followed the World Economic Forum for a long time, you know that Professor Schwab came up with this whole idea of stakeholder theory, and that was really the foundation on which we were built. And this is the idea that all stakeholders should be participating uh, in the economic process. And that's really the idea behind this report. Now, this is really a very simple way of looking at the methodology behind the report. Uh, what we have here is a leaf. We're calling it a leaf. Uh, and the leaf is made up of seven different pillars, uh, different drivers, as I said, of inclusive growth. And each of these are, in turn, made up of other factors, so sort of sub-pillars. And there are 15 uh, in all. And let me just very quickly go through what are the things that we're looking at, because I have some sort of you know, very short titles there. Uh, we're looking at things that you might think of when you think about inclusive growth, uh, things like fiscal transfers uh, and redistribution, very important. 
We also look at education and skills. And there we're looking not just at the quantity or the quality of education, which are both important, but also the equity of outcomes based on socioeconomic background. You know, are young people penalized because they come from poorer families? So those things are perhaps, you know, some of the aspects that you might think of in general, but we look at five other areas uh, that are really important. And let me go from left to right on the screen. We look at employment uh, and wages, so really gainful employment, safe employment, uh, as well as wages and the extent to which they are reasonable and rising. We look at asset building and entrepreneurship, important for inclusive growth because you can create your own jobs. Financial intermediation, in particular, how access to finance allows for real economy investment. Again, very good for both growth and social inclusion. Corruption, uh, really, really one of the most insidious things, if you think, in terms of eroding both at growth and at social inclusion, in terms of allowing those with power to take advantage of those without. Also rents, uh, the extent to which the concentration of the economy is held in few hands. And finally, basic services and infrastructure. And there we're looking at all kinds of infrastructure, transport infrastructure, obviously also uh, you know, technological linkages, but also really health infrastructure. Again, clearly very important for the growth process for healthy people uh, and also uh, for uh, inclusion. Now, we cover 112 countries in the report covering all these different indicators. One thing that is important to note is it's a little different than the Global Competitiveness Report, which is a sister report to this one that the forum has been coming out with for a long time. We don't wrap this up into one overall ranking. Why is this? Because this is new, and we're not sure how to weight all these things. Is employment and wages more important than education? Uh, you know, are basic services more important than tackling corruption? We don't know what the, what the relative weighting is. So right now what we do is we come up with, uh, you know, basically a rating for each one of these individual areas, the 15 sub areas, so you can compare yourself to your peers, and then we look at countries within four different income groups. Why do we separate them into income groups? Because we want to know based on what countries have at their disposal, uh, in terms of resources, how well they're doing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through three different countries that are at different uh, income levels and just to get a flavor of how you might start looking at this report uh, and using it. The last thing I'd say just before we look at the first one, which will be the United States, is that we use a coloring system a little like you're seeing here, uh, which is like a traffic light system. Green is good, yellow not so good, red bad, uh, to get a sense of how countries are faring vis-a-vis -vis their peers in their own income group. So the first one we're going to look at is the United States. This is obviously a high income, advanced economy. And what do we see here? We see one green piece of the leaf. Uh, and where is that? That's an asset building and entrepreneurship. Now, the US is the world's innovation powerhouse, and this is obviously not surprising. It has an excellent uh, environment for business creation, and, and this is clearly coming out in the, in the report. However, if you see, most of the other areas show the U.S. falling behind when you, come, when you think about inclusive growth. And I'm not going to go into all the areas, but in particular, what we're seeing uh, is that in the area of employment, uh, although there's relatively low unemployment now, it's been coming down, wages remain actually quite low for a large part of the population. And at the same time, this is not being made up for with the social safety net. Uh, this uh, is paired and obviously very strongly related to the fact that there's been rising inequality in the U.S. In fact, it's reached rates not seen since the 1920s. Uh, and this is something that's actually really dampening consumption, which is a big problem in a country like the U.S. where consumption is such a big part of, of uh, GDP. So uh, really air efforts needed in this area. The second uh, country I'll look at is China. I would be remiss if I were sitting in China and I did not talk about China. Uh, there's a few interesting things to see here. Now, this is an upper middle income country, as are most of the BRICs except for India. Uh, and we see, uh, number one, that uh, we're missing uh, the part of the, of the diagram for uh, education, and that's because we're missing some of the education data there. But we're hoping that we'll be able to collect it in the future. Uh, however, you can see a lot uh, from the screen. You see, first of all, that, in fact, compared to other countries at the same level of economic development uh, and resources, that uh, it's had quite a dynamic uh, environment for the creation of businesses. This is linked, uh, then, uh, to quite a good environment for employment. Uh, if you look at the employment area, 
Uh, now, that's because there's quite a high uh, labor participation rate in China, uh, quite uh, low unemployment rates, although you do have to keep in mind, and Tian and I were just talking about that recently, uh, that wages do remain quite low. Uh, now, in terms of areas for improvement, uh, in particular, uh, we'd point out uh, the importance of developing more basic services uh, and infrastructure throughout the country, uh, which is something that will continue to be important, particularly in the health area. We're finding that there are some weaknesses, also partially related to the environment. Obviously, corruption uh, will continue to be an area of focus. And finally, I'd say very importantly, continuing to build out uh, the uh, social safety net uh, to more of the population, which would be an important way of decreasing savings, actually, and increasing consumption as the, the country tries to rebalance its economy. Finally, just quickly look at Tunisia. I thought Tunisia might be an interesting lower middle income example because this is where the Arab Spring was sparked, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it's another quite interesting story. Uh, for its level of income, uh, actually Tunisia does relatively well in terms of providing basic services and infrastructure, particularly related to health. It's also doing what it can in terms of taxation and redistribution to those most in need. However, not surprising, the biggest issue uh, is really the uh, area of employment and labor compensation. Tunisia is a country where you have very high levels of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, and many people are forced uh, to work in the informal sector. So again, you know, this is, this is basically what had led in the beginning to a lot of the unrest that we saw there. Uh, and so really job creation and employment creation will be critical there. I'll just uh, finish with a few key learnings from the report uh, that we found uh, from kind of going through the results uh, and, and just in general from the process. I think first, it's very important to keep in mind that the current debate has really been quite narrow. And what we're trying to do here is to show, as we've seen, that there are really many factors uh, that can drive uh, both economic growth and social inclusion together. Uh, related to this, the second point is that it's possible to be both pro-equity and pro-growth at the same time, and not only because of the logic that we've just gone through, but if you look at the results of this report compared to those of the Global Competitiveness Report, we see actually that many of the countries that do well in a lot of the areas here also do very well in terms of the drivers of productivity and competitiveness. Uh, the third, and I think we've seen this a bit, but you can see it more if you look at the report, is that Promoting social inclusion is not just under the purview of rich countries. This is not just a rich country luxury. We see that many countries are actually doing very well and punching above their weight in a number of areas. Uh, and so all countries can really uh, work on this. Uh, and finally, uh, another thing that's really important to note is that all countries have room for improvement, even those that do very well, uh, the Nordics, for example, many of the Nordics, uh, they do not uh, score above average across all the areas and few come even close. Uh, so I think just to make the point that all countries really have uh, work to do in this area to make their growth process more inclusive. And I'll just end by saying that we're bringing this uh, to, uh, to the fore, uh, this whole piece of work, in the hopes that it will provide some uh, useful uh, fodder for discussion uh, in order to really make progress uh, in these areas. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We learned a lot. Very interesting work. Uh, certainly inspiring, I'm sure. Going to be helpful also for our later rounds of discussion. But very quick Q&A, if I can, with you, because there are certain points I really need to have you clarify it before we go. Um, first of all, why these five factors and also the 15 areas you're looking at, how they are being chosen quickly? Okay. Actually, there's seven areas. Seven areas. Um, I, you know, what we did, obviously there always has to be some subjectivity in this, but what we did was we scanned what's being done. We talked to many, many people, uh, many experts, uh, and uh, came up with what we think is a good beta version. I mean, let's be clear, this is the first draft and we're very open to comments. Um, but, you know, you have to start somewhere, mm -hmm. and we felt that this kind of gave a good sense of those areas uh, where um, people can really kind of understand that they're both good for growth and for social inclusion. Okay, second point. Something I find that when it comes to the area, seven areas you mentioned, they could be contradictory within themselves. I mean, first of all, when it comes to the United States, employment and also compensation, sometimes the employment rate could be high, but the compensation could be low. I mean, this sounds 
when you put them together, are they really fitting together? Secondly, about China, for example, when you talk about corruption, I think mm -hmm. there was one thing. Uh, were you talking about the level of corruption and how rampant the corruption is, or you, were you talking about the degree as to the measures and the actions to curb corruption? Yeah, um, so we're mostly looking at inputs here. Uh, and on the first one, I think point really well taken. When you present this in 10 minutes uh, and you have to sum it up, I think that you do end up having things like corruption and rents, which are a little difficult to explain. Why did we put them together? But that's why, actually, if you go and look at the report, it's very useful to look at all 15. Uh, if, you, if you look at corruption, we're more looking at... Um, uh, sorry, at the outputs, actually, the extent to which you're actually seeing payoffs and bribes and things like that. Mm. Um, but we do know that a lot is going on here uh, and around the world, and we're hoping that that will actually uh, mitigate some of those uh, negative outcomes. And the actually, statistic and numbers are very important to you guys if you really want to compel an important report. Okay, Absolutely. final question. Yeah. Why is this important for us? We have seen inclusive... Uh, uh, growth uh, reports coming from other international organizations and think tanks. So why is this different? Why is it going to be useful for us? Um, I think probably because um, given that we are an inter, um, I say a multi-stakeholder organization, I usually try not to say that, but we bring together business, government, civil society, and all actors. Uh, we're able to get a lot of people around the table to really talk about this. Uh, and finally, I just say, because we're the World Economic Forum and we're not an intergovernmental organization, sometimes we can come out with things that are a little closer to rankings uh, than some other of our um, very um, favorite partner institutions on the project. And I would like to just thank the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, and the ILO for all the excellent uh, input that they've given to us in this project. Mm. And once again, numbers and statistics are always important for a wonderful report. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jennifer Blank, Thank for you. sharing Thank with you. us this wonderful report. Thank, Thank you. you. We learned a lot. Appreciate it.